Hey guys, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So before we get into today's video, I have a very exciting announcement to share with you guys. I have my very first sponsor on this channel and I really think you guys are going to love it. I have had several other companies reach out, you know, offering to sponsor a video, but I just haven't been interested in any of their products and I'm not going to talk about products and try to get you guys to buy them when I don't care about them myself. But today's sponsor is a company that I actually really love. So today's sponsor is Hunt a Killer. Now I know so many of you guys are as obsessed with true crime as I am and Hunt a Killer actually gives you the opportunity to completely immerse yourself into the world of true crime by helping to solve a fictional murder. Each month, Hunt a Killer will send you a new box full of evidence, witness statements, police reports, audio recordings, case files, and more. Each box acts as an episode that will give you the next bit of evidence that you need to continue your investigation. This continues for a whole season of six months. With each box that you get, you eliminate a suspect until the very end when you gather all of your evidence and figure out exactly who the murderer is. Hunt a Killer is perfect for a night in with your family, date night, game night with your friends, or if you prefer a solo investigation, that's perfect too. It's actually really cool because you get very real looking like witness statements, police documents, and they send you some like real pieces of evidence, not just pictures, which I think is really cool. Hunt a Killer is one of the fastest growing subscription boxes in the country and there's actually an entire online community where you can interact with the thousands of other subscribers that they have. Hunt a Killer starts at $25 per box which is honestly really great in my opinion. I don't know about you but a night out costs me a lot more than $25 and I honestly had a lot more fun just sitting at home relaxing, being at home with my boyfriend and analyzing evidence and investigating a crime than I normally do on a night out. Plus, you know that your money is going towards a good cause because a portion of the proceeds from every single box goes towards the Cold Case Foundation, an organization that helps real life cold cases be solved. I actually just got done with the first box the other night with my boyfriend and we had such a good time just putting everything together, going through all the evidence, and eliminating the first suspect. It's actually really satisfying when you figure out who to eliminate in the first box. I know I felt pretty good, my boyfriend was really excited. A lot of you know that I'm a med student who is constantly studying and working while researching and making these videos for you guys, and I honestly originally thought that this was going to be very stressful, that playing this game every month was going to be stressful, and I honestly just want to really relax and do literally nothing when I'm at home, but as weird as it sounds, it was honestly so relaxing and so much fun and I honestly have not stopped thinking about when I'm going to get onto the next box to figure out what happens. Even my boyfriend who isn't even into true crime whatsoever really enjoyed playing, so I think your friends and family will too. The good news is, is that my subscribers can get 20% off their first box by using the code Rachel Shannon. that's R-A-C-H-E-L-S-H-A-N-N-O-N, -N -N, my name, which I'm just so excited about, you guys don't even know. So make sure to go over to Hunt a Killer and use code Rachel Shannon to get 20% off your first box. Trust me, you will be so happy and excited when you receive that first box on your doorstep. Okay, so now that I had time to talk about today's sponsor, let's just get right into today's video. Today, we are going to be discussing the unsolved disappearance of a young woman who just seemed to have vanished off the face of the earth. I was really set into my opinions when I initially went into research, but after looking into this case at every angle, I honestly don't even know what to think. So with that being said, let's just get right into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the unsolved disappearance of Courtney Stouffer. Courtney Stouffer was described as being free-spirited and fun-loving. She loved spending time outside, traveling, or spending time with her family. She loved music and had actually sang in different musicals over the years. She loved animals, especially her black lab, Sheba, who she got for her eighth 
birthday and her pet snake. She took great care of her animals and spent a lot of time walking her dog around town and pretty much didn't go anywhere without her dog. Now, Courtney was all about family. She never missed family events for anything. She never missed a family meal, especially if her mom was cooking. When she didn't live at home, she would go to her family's house at least once a month to eat dinner with her family. She was just she was just such a huge family girl and never missed an opportunity to spend time with her parents and siblings. At the time of her disappearance, she was working as a hairstylist and a dog groomer while doing some modeling on the side as well. She was really starting to make something of herself and was really excited about what the future would hold for her. Now, in early 2012, Courtney had moved out of her family's home into an apartment at 810 West Main Street in Palmyra, Pennsylvania with her boyfriend of about a year, Brad. This was exciting and a very big life transition for Courtney but living on her own didn't come without its challenges. Those around Courtney described her as being a sort of hippie, like flower child, but she did have a more stubborn and feisty side to her. Throughout her time living at this apartment, she did have some issues with her neighbors. They did get into some arguments and disagreements, but it usually never really got too far out of hand. Now, around the time that Courtney went missing, her boyfriend was actually on probation under house arrest for driving under the influence while being underage. He had to wear an ankle monitor and was not supposed to be drinking. However, on Saturday, July 28th, Courtney and Brad decided to have some friends over for a small party at their apartment, which of course included drinking alcohol. As you can imagine, it got kind of loud in their apartment, which probably annoyed their downstairs neighbor, so the downstairs neighbor called police. Now, I'm not sure if they knew that Brad wasn't supposed to be drinking. They probably knew that he was on house arrest because it is pretty hard to hide an ankle monitor that he had to wear all the time, but it has been reported that these neighbors knew that he was drinking while he wasn't supposed to, so that's why they called police, but either way, they did call police, whether it was because they just didn't like Brad and they wanted to tell on him or because they were being annoying upstairs neighbors while being loud, but either way, the police were called and Brad's parole officer showed up and arrested him. Of course, Courtney was very angered by this and assumed that Brad would have a very lengthy prison sentence because of this. He didn't actually end up staying in jail that long, but of course, when this is all happening, she's like freaking out and she's just thinking that he's gonna be in jail for years and years and years. She just automatically assumed that the neighbors were the ones who had called, so she just went off on them in complete anger. She was frustrated, but she just decided to blow off some steam by going out and continuing on with her night. She actually had texted her brother asking him if he wanted to come, but he said no. So she called up her two friends, Cody Pruitt and Milton Rodriguez, to come out with her that night. On the way to the bars, Courtney and them had stopped at the gas station in Milton's 2004 Acura. They went to different bars in the town, kind of went bar hopping, but they ultimately ended up at the hardware bar. Of course, they were drinking, partying, and having a good time until Courtney had actually gotten into an argument with some other guy at the bar. Now, I don't know 100% for sure what this entire argument was about, and we will get more into those details a little bit later, and I don't know if police were called or how serious this whole thing was, but she did end up getting kicked out of the bar. After this, she just wanted to call it a night and go back to her apartment. So the three left the hardware bar together, but on the way back to the apartment, Milton was dropped off and then Cody and Courtney went back to her place. Now, when they got back to Courtney's apartment, Courtney saw a bunch of people downstairs in one of the apartment units. This had apparently made her upset and I mean, she probably was still very angry about Brad being arrested earlier and the neighbors calling and snitching on them for having a party when they seemed to be having a party themselves. So she went and confronted these neighbors. Now, I had read in some reports that before she went out, she had confronted the neighbors as well. 
and after she confronted them and I don't know if she confronted the same ones as before or if she had confronted different neighbors that she assumed maybe took part in getting Brad arrested, I don't know. But either way, she went up to them and just let them have it. Now, two of the neighbors who live in the apartment below Courtney, Janice Ryman Schneider, I hope I'm saying that right, and Richard Sheets reported seeing her kicking and swinging at another neighbor in the complex, Todd Saxick who was next door to Courtney. Apparently, they were up in each other's faces, screaming back and forth, and it was getting very heated. So Cody got in between them and tried to calm this fight down, but he also had said some very colorful things to the neighbors as he was doing so. This led to the neighbors calling police who showed up at around 3 a.m. They saw just how bad this fight was getting, so they broke everything up and ended up staying until almost 4 a.m., interviewing everyone involved and getting everyone's side of the story until everyone eventually went into their own apartments for the night. But then, once again, 30 minutes later, Todd, the next door neighbor, called police on Courtney again because he said that she was stomping around on her floor and screaming in anger. Police arrived once again, but when they knocked on Todd's door, he didn't answer. When they went to Courtney's door, she didn't answer either. All of the lights were turned off and it seemed like everyone just went to bed. Later, Todd went on to say that he didn't answer the door because he eventually just went to bed after Courtney stopped stomping and assumed that she had just gone to bed as well. When police spoke to Cody, he said that he had known Courtney for two years and referred to her as his sister. He said that when she was done stomping, he went to bed at her place and assumed that Courtney had done the same. Now, that next morning, Cody woke up at around 7 a.m. and wasn't able to find Courtney anywhere in the apartment. This didn't seem like too much of a concern at first though because he just thought that she could have been in a different room at the time, so he decided to head over to the local mini mart to grab some food and drinks while texting Courtney to see where she was and saying that he would see her later. Him being at the store and texting Courtney was confirmed by surveillance footage picked up from the store, but I don't understand why he didn't just check the other room to see that she was in there or if he really did just didn't think anything of it and was like, you know, she's just in the other room and then didn't actually think that it was a concern until after all of this happened or how this went, but they made it seem like he was a little bit concerned at first, which if you were, you'd think he would have gone and checked the room to make sure, but I don't know, maybe he didn't want to disturb her. Maybe he just didn't really think anything of it at the time, so we can't really judge him for not looking more because, you know, again, if you wake up and your friend's not right there, especially if they're not your significant other, it's safe to assume that they're just in another room. However, after that night, no one had seen Courtney ever again. That Monday, when Courtney didn't show up to the Lebanon area fair later that day to meet her family like she was supposed to, Courtney's mother, Wendy, headed over to Courtney's apartment. When she got there, she was met with two barking dogs, one being Courtney's and the other one being Brad's. The TV was on, the air conditioning was running, and all of the items were pretty much exactly where they were supposed to be. In the apartment parking lot was her car. In the apartment was her purse with her wallet still in it, her keys, her cell phone, which was plugged into the charger, her shoes, which were laying on the ground where she normally just kicked them off at the end of the day, and her dog was there, which was weird because like I mentioned before, Courtney took her dog with her everywhere. This was when Wendy realized that Something was horribly wrong, and this was described by Wendy as being the worst day of her life. She called the authorities immediately and reported Courtney as missing. When police showed up, nothing really seemed out of the ordinary. Like I said, her belongings were just sitting in their proper places around the apartment. There was no sign of a break-in, and there was no sign of a struggle anywhere. But they knew that something about the situation just wasn't right. They knew that if she had just 
taken off and left on her own accord that she would have at least taken her purse and her cell phone. So they immediately treated this case as if there was foul play involved. They immediately started their search for Courtney but didn't really know where to start. Investigators and Courtney's family went around the area where she lived and canvassed the entire area but found no sign of Courtney anywhere. They got a warrant to search Milton's car as well as Courtney's 2002 Ford Focus, but we don't actually know the results of those searches. They interviewed the neighbors who she was fighting with that night who said that they had no idea what happened to Courtney. The neighbors allowed sniffer dogs to go through their apartments and be searched, and they had been pretty cooperative with the entire investigation. One of the neighbors, who was 47 years old and had a college-aged daughter at the time, said that despite what happened that night, they wish no ill will on Courtney and they still pray for her. Cody has also been very cooperative with police, did interviews, submitted his DNA, and took a polygraph test and passed. Pretty much everyone at this point believes that Courtney was met with someone outside of her apartment and that she was met with foul play. But investigators and the family really had no idea what could have possibly happened to Courtney and her father Scott said that his suspicions run in all directions. This was until about two years after the disappearance in 2014 when Wendy actually received a private Facebook message from a woman named Amanda claiming to be Courtney's friend. Amanda said that she knew what happened to Courtney, so Wendy asked her to go to police with this information, which she did. Amanda said that Courtney was harmed because of drugs. She said that the morning of her disappearance, two men came over to Courtney's apartment looking for money and drugs, but found neither and ended up harming her rolling her into a carpet and driving over to the Memorial Lake where they weighed down her body and threw her in. Immediately, police searched this lake with sonar equipment and divers, but found absolutely no sign of the carpet or Courtney in the lake. Now, according to Scott, Amanda is one of the friends that Courtney was thought to have been with the night she went missing, so he does believe that what she was saying could be true, but since they found no evidence of it, they are pretty much back at square one with the investigation and they have no idea if this is really what happened to her. So at this point, that's pretty much all of the information we have on this case. A lot of the information from this case have come from Courtney's parents because police really haven't released much and honestly, we don't even really have any of the actual evidence that police have found. Like I said, they conducted searches on the cars and I'm assuming they searched her apartment but just haven't released any of their findings. They could have a lot more to this case that we just don't know publicly and they may even have different suspects in mind, but we really have no idea. So now we get into the theories on this case. A lot of the theories in this case are pretty out there and they do not seem realistic at all. Obviously, it's pretty hard to come up with a theory that makes sense because again, we really don't know a lot. Even if there are a lot of theories that make sense to us, they could possibly be very off if there's a lot of information pointing away from it that we just don't know. It's also possible that some of the very unlikely theories to us are possible because there may be information pointing towards them that, again, we just don't know about because police have not released it. So it is a little bit frustrating, but for now, we can just try and come up with the most reasonable theories that make the most sense based on what we know. A lot of people think that Courtney just left her life by her own choosing because she just wanted to start over and leave everything behind, possibly because of some sort of mental illness. Maybe she had some problems in her life that was going on that we just don't know about. Either way, some people have rumored that she started this new life in Florida or Colorado and just has been living out there ever since. We know that mental illnesses such as schizophrenia start appearing in the early to mid 20s and some people have said that Courtney was very depressed, so maybe she was just so upset with how her life was going and was suffering from some sort of mental illness that no one really knew about that she just 
up and left. But honestly, despite all of that, I just don't think that that's a very likely theory. If she did just want to go off and start a new life, I feel like she wouldn't have just left all of her stuff like that. There would have been some sort of signs that she packed at least something. Even if she did choose to leave her cell phone and anything that could track her identity behind, she would have packed some clothes, would have taken her toothbrush maybe, or brought some cash, which is untraceable on like a credit card, just to get by for a while, but there was no sign of that. Also, she left her dog. That stands out to me a lot because I'm only a year older than she was when she went missing and she had that dog for half of her life. I got my dog around the same age that she did and that is a connection that runs so deep that I could never even think of leaving my dog behind even if I wanted to restart my life somewhere else. Having a dog pretty much your whole life that you can remember is a bond that you can't just up and leave. I definitely would have taken my dog and she loved her dog so much that she literally took her everywhere. I truly believe that if she would leave, that she would have taken her dog. There's no way you can track a dog. There's no reason to leave your dog behind if you are just wanting to leave your life. I honestly don't put too much emphasis into this theory and I just don't think that it's very likely. The next theory, which I also don't think is very likely, is that she took her own life. And this theory is basically using the same logic as before. Again, possibly having some sort of mental break, some sort of mental issues, or maybe even some sort of mental issues caused by drugs, and maybe she was depressed. But again, the way that she left her apartment just screams someone who left very, very abruptly or someone who was taken out of their apartment against their will. Also, I think that after all of these searches, that if this was the case, that they would have found her body by now. So again, I don't put too much into this theory. The next theory is that Courtney was met with foul play and that this entire thing is involving drugs. Now, it has been confirmed that she was involved in some sort of substance use. According to Scott, she had made some new friends that she wasn't always involved with. He said that these friends and this lifestyle was not an everyday thing for her, but that it was enough that these friends had enough of an influence on her that they changed her life path into a different direction. Also, it was confirmed that the man that Courtney was seen arguing with the night of her disappearance was a drug dealer. Again, we don't know what this argument was about for sure, but some people have come out and said that Courtney owed this man a lot of money. Others had come out saying that she was actually accusing him of breaking into her apartment, and that's what they were arguing about. We don't know 100% for sure, but that is what people have said. I haven't really seen much more about this, but with this, there are two things that immediately jump into my head. First, if these stories are true, it is very telling, and I don't know who this man is, but I feel like police probably do and have hopefully looked into him because this just seems like too much of a coincidence that she was just fighting with some guy about maybe breaking into her apartment and then she just turns up missing. I don't really know what to make of this entire situation and I just hope that police have looked into it thoroughly. The other aspect of this theory is that we know Amanda had come forward admitting that she knew that whatever happened to Courtney was in fact involved with drugs. Again, we do know that they didn't find her in the lake, but that doesn't mean that they didn't miss her or maybe they just got the lake wrong. I did see in one source that her family didn't think that police did a great job with that search of the lake, so if that's true, they easily could have missed something. Now, obviously this isn't confirmed and we don't know 
for sure. We don't know if she's in this lake. We don't know if the parents are just frustrated and that's why they said that they didn't do a very good job of searching. But either way, I do think that this theory is very possible. It could be possible that that night someone came over in the early morning hours looking for drugs or money and she just didn't have it so they harmed her. Now, one interesting part to this theory that I saw was that it could be possible that the stomping and yelling that the neighbors heard was actually her being attacked. I think this is very possible because let's just think about what happened that night. Courtney had been in this huge fight with her neighbors the whole night. They got all settled, but then once again, they heard this giant commotion coming from Courtney's apartment. Without even thinking, they might still be angry, so they just assumed that she was stomping around and screaming on purpose, so they called police, but then by the time police had gotten there, it was completely silent. That just seems so strange to me that she's so worked up and angry one second, but then it just suddenly stopped and went to bed with no problem. But if she was being attacked, it makes sense that she may have just been putting up an intense fight she was harmed and that's why it stopped so suddenly. So is it possible that someone came over looking for money at that moment and she just didn't have it so they harmed her? Maybe her friend saw but is too scared to say anything because, you know, he doesn't want anything to happen to him so he created an alibi for himself by texting her the next morning. Maybe it was even Cody who was the one who did hurt her. Now he did pass a polygraph test and has been very cooperative, but he was the only one that was known to have been with her that night and he was the last one to see her alive. So that automatically puts him into being sort of suspicious. So that's always possible. Now the next theory, which kind of relates to this theory of the friend being involved, is that maybe she had overdosed on drugs or had alcohol poisoning and died that night. Maybe her friends thought that they would get in trouble or thought that police would look into them as being responsible or just didn't want to get caught with whatever drugs they had, so they hid her body. Now, I don't think that this is a super likely theory given the fact that the neighbors had seen her that night and she probably was intoxicated, but I feel like if she was the point of overdosing or getting alcohol poisoning, that someone would have noticed just how badly intoxicated she was. I imagine she would have started vomiting or passed out somewhere and wouldn't even have had the energy or the soberness to even get into these arguments and be coherent. The fact that no one had mentioned, as far as I know, that she seemed completely inebriated makes me believe that she was at least sober enough to know what was going on, which means that she probably didn't consume enough to have died from it. And also, again, police were there. If she was so badly under the influence that she was going to die from it, police would have seen something. Now, there are a lot of theories online that discuss the possibility of a stranger happening upon her and taking her. Maybe after she was angry, she just stepped out of the apartment and got into the car with someone who did something to her. Maybe she went on a walk to cool her head, didn't put on her shoes, and someone took this as an opportunity to harm her. I do think that these are possibilities and shouldn't be completely looked over, but I do think that based on what we know, the theory of someone that she knows coming over and harming her possibly because of drugs is the most likely. I think that it probably involved drugs or her owing someone money. Even her father admitted that she was involved in that sort of lifestyle, so that's always possible. It could have possibly been for any other reason, but I don't think that it was someone completely random. I don't think that she left on her own accord. I feel like it is possible that maybe a neighbor was involved, but I don't really know. To me, that just isn't what seems to be the most likely. It seems pretty extreme to hurt someone just because they're being annoying and disruptive. 
It does happen, but I don't think it's very likely. It seems more likely to me that they would have tried to get the landlord or police involved to try and get her kicked out or something like that. It is strange that that very night she just happened to get into this huge fight with them and then she goes missing. But this seems to be something that has happened more than one time and she seems to be very feisty and has no problem telling it like it is and confronting people. So it's very possible that whoever she fought with at the bar is responsible. It's possible that she owed money to someone and that person is responsible. That is what I lean more towards in this case because I do think that that is the biggest motive compared to her neighbors. So again, like I said multiple times, I think it's the most likely that she either owed someone money or, you know, whatever, and that they came over and harmed her at her place and then hid her or they just took her from her place and then harmed her elsewhere. I kind of feel like if they did harm her there or if there was this huge scuffle that the friend would have heard, I do think it's strange that he seems not to know a single thing. It does seem a little bit convenient that whoever took her was able to do so while he was sleeping without him hearing a thing. It is always possible, but I don't know if they didn't harm her there, if they just were able to get her out of the apartment and then took her from there. I could see how it's possible that it was quiet enough that no one heard. The only explanation of that that I can think of is that they knocked on her door. She recognized who it was. Maybe she opened the door expecting to just talk to them. She stepped out into the hallway and then that's when they harmed her. At the end of the day, we have a young, beautiful woman who went missing out of absolutely nowhere. She was going to go on to do great things in her life and she had a family and friends who absolutely loved her. I can't even imagine what they're going through, especially hearing all of these awful possibilities of what possibly could have happened to her. I just hope that sometime soon they can figure out what happened to her and finally get the closure that they desperately need. Courtney Stouffer went missing on July 29th, 2012 from her apartment home in Palmyra. She is five foot eight inches tall and 115 pounds with green eyes and long blonde hair. She has a mole on her right cheek and several tattoos. One tattoo is on her right bicep that says one love, another on her foot that is stars, and a final one on her hip of a pistol with flowers coming out of it. If you have absolutely any information regarding Courtney's case, please contact 717-272-2054. So that is all I have for today's case, and now I want to know what you guys think. Do you think that she was taken because of drugs? Do you think that it was a neighbor or do you think that it was a stranger or do you think that she left on her own accord? Please let me know down below. But either way, if you liked this video, please make sure to leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, please send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. I read every single case suggestion that I receive, so do not hesitate to send those over. Also, make sure to check out huntakiller.com and use code RACHELSHANNON for 20% off your first box. With that, I hope you guys have a great week, and I hope to see you next time. Bye! <laughs>